I did not accept this heartbreaking message. I kept working with him and pushed his educators to teach him to verbalize, and I met a lot of resistance. As it turns out, in 2013, researchers from the Kennedy Krieger Institute Center for Autism and Related Disorders and John Hopkins University School of Medicine conducted a study involving 535 children ages 8 to 17 with autism and severe speech delays and found that nearly half became fluent speakers. Amazing. I founded Apropos Software to develop game apps that I could not find for my son. He loves his iPad, as do most children, but children with autism in particular. I was astounded that with his lack of interest for most activities, how motivated he was with it. There is something about the reliable and consistent feedback from a computer that is so appealing to him. I thought that if there was a speech activated app, that would require him to use his voice, he might be motivated to speak for fun, independently. I am developing educational game apps that use speech recognition software with the intent to give incentive to individuals with speech delays and others to speak for fun and gain practice using their voices. My app would appeal to early language learners as well and could be translated into other languages. Orange. son is now 14, and because I did not give up hope, he has several phrases and a growing vocabulary that has opened up his world. He can say he's hungry, wants water, wants a hug, wants to go home, needs to go to the bathroom, all pretty important information. I believe technology can help my beautiful child and others with disabilities improve their lives while having fun. My dream is to help them use their voices and be heard. Won't you help? There are some glitches, and I think, you know, the prompting needs to be varied a little bit, and, you know, not just what colors are the color, you know, and some more stars and chimes, but we're working on that. And um, so, anyway, you're the first to see my app, and thanks for watching. And are there any questions? Oh, I might add that 
we were working on a list of approximations so that you know children who can't pronounce um, the colors <clears throat> the way that we do, uh, it would be recognized using a. Um, somebody told me what this term is called: phonetic processing, um, which is a standard kind of list of like what uh, children who are learning how to talk the kind of similar the patterns that they will make um, have before they have learned how to speak, which I think a lot of kids with autism have the same, not all of them, but a lot of them have the same issues, the same kind of patterns that a voice recognition could accept and react to in a logical way, not just uh, mimicking or registering volume or, you know, but, so. Okay. Uh, no, we're going to be, I do plan to do that. Oh, there's a whole bunch of approximations that we go through. So uh, I think for each one at this point, we have something like six or seven uh, for each response. But we actually plan on making that bigger because uh, as she was saying, there are words that are close enough. But we're using the adult sample right now. Uh, and as we, uh, as we bring on and test with more autistic kids, we should be able to relax the standard more and more. And that's actually been one of the tough things about this, is figuring out that matrix of and, what. But is that done with the voice recording or like a phonetic spelling? And I think yeah, we'll do it probably with both. We'll use the phonetic spelling piece as well. But there's also going to be some feedback loop that when we do a beta test run, we say, ah, this you know, a majority of the kids say it this way, so let's tweak it and allow for that. That's it. And it's nice that um, every color, every label of colors, not 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 no two sound uh, similar. We did it that way like with numbers too. Okay. <laughs> See, I'm not a linguistics major. <laughs> I'm just sort of using common sense. I know, uh, Vasuki was telling me when that happened and uh, that it only recognized blue as blue, so I'm 
No, it, it does, it recognizes blue as well, but when you say blue, particularly you, it yeah. <laughs> recognizes it as, as blue, <laughs> for some reason, it doesn't pick up the blue. The so there's a lot to, you know, fix and iron out. But the technology is progressing, it's our future, and so why shouldn't it be accessible to, you know, people with speech delays as well, you know, to help them learn how to speak, not just to speak for them, you know. Right, yeah, that's that's one of my issues is that um, a lot of our kids are taught how to man or, you know, to request what they want to eat or where they want to go and instead of just making observations about their world, which is really important for, like, joint engagement, you know, um, to talk about what's in their environment. I think they can learn to do that, you know. Diagnosis is deficits in uh, social reciprocity, communication, and also repetitive or stereotyped behavior, and that some proximate, like um, not necessarily the ultimate reasons, but some immediate reasons why some of these problems may occur are uh, attention relatively more to objects versus people and more to mouths versus eyes. Um, and um, also, another approximate mechanism is like uh, problems with categorization, and for example, distinguishing between, uh, early on between uh, mother's voice and other person's voice, uh, speech versus non-speech, um, identifying whose face it is or which uh, emotion is being expressed by a face, um, and language, of course, language, and. I'll try to emphasize the connection between categorization and language because this is something that, that I have researched. So, um, how do we learn to categorize? We've probably all heard the news that there are some remote languages that have only like two color categories, um, light and dark. And if there's a third, um, if there's a third, maybe it's red. Of course, we're not learning to categorize nothing. We have, we have lots of... Was that off the whole time? No, we're fine. No. Is that way too loud? It's perfect. Okay. okay. Um, th there's a lot of color stimuli coming in all the time. And so to say that I have one word for light and one word for dark, what it means is like, if I see colors over here, I'll use, I'll use my word for light, and over here, I'll use my word for dark. And if I speak a language that invents another color word, it will generally be red, and I'll use that word for colors up there. Um, and it's not the same. It's been argued that we see these things all the same with our eyes, but it's not the same across languages, which, which what gets categorized how. 
So for example, um, I have actually forgotten. This is this is a yellow light, right? It's yellow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so it's up there in terms of what it, what it looks like. But interestingly, uh, Germans call it yellow, but Dutch call it orange. Um, and if you ask them to like choose a color, like show them a color palette and say, "Hey, German person. Hey, Dutch person. Like, what color is in the middle traffic light?" Well, the Dutch speaker will pick like a slightly orange or crayon, and the German speaker will pick a slightly yellow or crayon. Um, and there are more complex linguistic categories than that that vary across languages. So, for example, in English, um, I can put things in like a container or put things on um, like on a surface or also also a ring or a, the lid of a pen that's slightly different than a table but those are all on things whereas in Korean the distinction is not so much in versus on but about tightness and fit so um, well that's one distinction so like a bowl and a bag fit things loosely. So I would use one word to describe that instead of, um, like here we would call these both, the apple is in the bowl and the book is in the bag. Um, but here there's a different word for the book going in the binding because it tightly fits in the binding. Um, and there's some other categories as well. So I, I just say this, I just, say this to mean that the categories are somewhat arbitrary and it's kind of like impressive that we can learn them at all because if we look at them from a different language they look weird and unlearnable so we should keep that in mind I guess and um, also there's some suggestion that in addition to the categories themselves being malleable by language that language actually it's not only that categorization, like deficit in categorization could impair language learning, but actually language learning may be in, importantly involved in learning categories. Um, so in one experiment, Fei presented uh, nine and 12 month old infants, uh, a duck and a ball coming out from behind the screen, and then she lowered the screen and revealed either both or just one of the objects. And the infants who knew these words, the 12 month old infants, thank you, um, they looked longer when only one of the objects was there, um, whereas the younger infants did not seem to notice. Remember that only one was ever visible at a time. A nine month old infant can readily know that there should be some object behind there. But does it notice if one of the kinds of objects is missing? Uh, this seems to be something that happens between 20, 10 and 12 months, uh, ordinarily. Also, if the duck goes behind the screen, um, the duck comes out from behind the screen, and the experimenter says, duck, and then goes back behind the screen. This is another study by Jim Carrey Welch from 1999. Um, then the ball comes out, and the experimenter says, ball. Then actually nine-month-old infants who don't know these words yet pass on this study. Um, whereas the same is not true if just two sounds are used, like ping and uh. Like, that doesn't work. Um, so, so what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> I think that's a fair question. So, um, it's, it's a bit speculative what it has to do with anything, but this is, uh, I don't know, this is what I'm speculating. I'm speculating that um, in, in autism spectrum disorder, maybe the, instead of like blue and red, there are instead many, many categories, even like each exemplar that I've seen in the world is its own experience and rather than being lumped together, many of them into one category. So, um, so that's, that's like, 
the, the challenge, I guess, I think, as I take it. Uh, in addition to academic things, I also work at this company, Kidaptive, and now I'm going to tell you that while Kidaptive certainly does not have all the answers to, to these things, we do have some useful tools that you might be interested in learning more about, and I'm going to talk about those now. Um, so first of all, there's an, an SDK which is called, which we call the Adaptive Learning Platform, and the idea is to make the learning part of educational apps um, something that many apps can share and use the, the same framework. Also, each, like let's say several apps use the same framework. Um, that data belongs to the learner or the learner's parents and can be shared across apps to build up a learner profile. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I skipped, I skipped one. First, um, it enables the, the SDK enables the creation of skill dimensions um, such as uh, communication or um, social reciprocity, um, uh, categorization. Thank you. 
frustrated, he was angry at us. Um, he was under the table, on the wall, and through technology, I noticed he loved the computer. We didn't have iPads then, he loved the computer. So through technology, and then later on the iPad, this young man became um, verbal, completely literate. He was typing 60 words a minute with only, only the two middle fingers. That's how it on the wall, 60 words a minute. For this child who was animalistic and, and uh, said he, and said for his mom to put him in an institution. So that's how I know the iPad works. And Mike is not alone. Children on the autism spectrum take the technology like a fish takes the water. I think we all know that. That's why we're here. Um, this is how it started. This is what um, in the fifties. This is what how it started. This was made for kids in wheelchairs. This is cerebral palsy. Um, and then the iPad came out, and not much changed. They took the Dynabox platform, everything that was on the um, Dynabox, and they put it onto an iPad. The good thing is that the kids love the iPad. The bad thing is it's the same technology. It's hard to build sentences. It's hard to build language. They used it to ask for things. They would say, Cheeto, 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 or French fries, I want to go to McDonald's. But no real conversations. More recently, we've had some developers really come out of and, and make some things that are more interactive, a little more to listen, to communicate, to, like Mia, to, to verbalize. The iPad has so many wonderful features. We're not stuck to just the grid anymore. We can do some fabulous things. Um, my app, Inner Voice, actually has a talking avatar. You can put your child's picture in here, you can put the Thomas train in here. Anything that gains their attention, they watch the avatar talk, and then that encourages them to talk with it. Acorn is another great one. This one learns your child. It will learn the language they use the most and give that to them to say. It's really nice. If anyone wants to see it, I have it on the iPad. We can put videos on these now. They're no longer static pictures. We can implant videos. We can do apps here and implant videos. There's text-to-speech. Any child who is having difficulty speaking, um, and they just, it just never comes, they become completely literate, and they use text-to-speech, and they type out wonderful, long books that, um, like I showed you, um, talk to you. Carly, Tito, and Tito are all nonverbal, yet they all can type. They've all written books. The middle guy, Tito, has written six books. So if they can't speak very well, we've got to give them some means to communicate. Text to speech is awesome. And there's a lot of fabulous um, features coming out with this. That's not all we can do though. There's speech apps out there. This is a list of apps like like me is that encourage speech. That are like cause and effect for the voice that keeps kids playing, teaching them how to make different sounds in different ways. Um, there's language. We have apps to build language now. They're fabulous. Literacy. We have to teach our kids literacy. We can't teach them the ABCs for 10 years anymore. It's just not working. We've got to get them into literacy. They love these apps. They play them without any reinforcement at all. Handwriting and keyboarding. I said keyboarding. Handwriting may never come. Just like speech, it's going to be difficult for them. It's going to be always challenging, but they can keyboard. Kids will learn to very, very well, and it's a wonderful way to communicate. Um, and the accessibility features. Every iPad has huge accessibility features in there. We need to start using them with our kids. They were made for our kids. Take a look at them and, and see what they are and use them. And edutainment. This is where the iPad comes. They're fun. They're like games. You can put games on here, like we have games. And they can play in their free time. They don't know that they're learning. They don't know that they're learning how to speak, learning how to read, or learning how to write. So entertainment is gives us the edge. Bottom line, I guess I'm trying to say is, yeah, I love this. This is great. This is how we meet and communicate with our kids now. And it works. I think that's all I'm going to say. Self-modeling um, is, self is evidence-based practice, and it's one of the most 
Naomi. Um, thank you very much to Nia for organizing this event and bringing us all together with common interests. Um, a little bit about me is I have um, no reason really to be here except um, a relationship um, or a few relationships with people I've met over the years um, and kind of alignment of opportunities that I see. So my background is on the business side. Um, I have over 10 years professional experience, some in global health and international development, um, and now I'm a consultant. Um, but I'm here to kind of introduce an idea or a concept that kind of um, I'm learning from those that presented before us. Um, so I'm open to feedback, ideas, um, any thoughts that you guys have on what I share. Um, so basically this is a PDF, so let me see if I can do this. Um, I have a focus on crowdsourcing assistive communication devices for cerebral palsy. So this is off the autism um, focus, um, but this is specific to um, marginalized people. So what I'm going to go through, try to do quickly, um, and if I'm not coherent, let me know. I have a half a glass of wine, so I think I'm talking intelligent, but I might not be. So first off is kind of the big picture. So what I'm trying to do um, is I see in the world today that there's this amazing online community of, of people who are responding to needs, opportunities. A good example is the Enable uh, community. Who here has heard of them? Anybody? All right, we got one person, two people. Um, but it's actually amazing. Um, I've met people who are part of this community, I've talked to them. Um, it's a global network of passionate volunteers using 3D printing to give the world a helping hand. They, a global community is basically rapidly prototyping and improving and reiterating on prosthetic hands for youth. Um, and they're just responding to their local neighborhood kids, making them printers, um, or bringing Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts together, making a bunch and sending them to a group um, in a different area. Um, the second kind of channel I'm looking at is technology advances. Um, with, as you guys know in the media, 3D printing is everywhere, but it's beyond that. There's a lot of patents that have expired over the years, and the advanced manufacturing tools themselves are becoming more accessible. So what does that mean for perhaps areas that maybe were limited in creating high quality products? Um, last, the third channel I'm tying in is labor surplus. So I spent a lot of uh, time in East Africa working with the uh, patient community, but also the business community and um, the informal markets. And basically people are working very hard for very small margins, but have you know, just the visions, just the, the energy, the desire, the, the need to, to make um, higher value products, basically, or opportunities for them and their families. Um, increased access to higher education through online portals. You guys, who here has taken an online course in the last couple of years? Anybody? Like a MOOC? 
Yes, so many, many people, right. Um, I was talking to a former Kenyan colleague and was saying, hey, because he was asking me, like, I want to go to school, I want to advance my education, like, well, check these out, um, they're free. Um, he was able to look at them and decide if they could help. So this is kind of the big picture of why I'm here and why I'm focusing on what I'm going to introduce to you. So this is the what, affordable, appropriate, accessible devices um, to enable persons with significant motor skill and communication challenges to communicate with whomever they wish. Um, so this is where we probably overlap. Um, my focus has been on the marginalized individuals and groups without existing access. So in the U.S. there's a lot of um, insurance or systems, maybe not perfect, um, but it makes it accessible. But in emerging markets with low-income families, there's a lot of stigma still for the disabled. Um, that's a lot more than here, I think, but I, again, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not the expert. And there's limited opportunities for value creation and self-actualization. So this is the why. Uh, this gentleman, his name is Dr. Zhu. He um, is a doctor himself. Well, he's a doctor. He's an orthopedic surgeon by training and practice. Um, but early in his career, he had an accident that left him quadriplegic. Um, he, he is in China, that's where he's based, and he went through a period of about 10 years of hospital care, um, lost his family, lost everything, lost his career, um, but made some good relationships with other people who had been in this position, and he said, okay, I can do something. They've done something, I can. And so what he did is he started this organization to work with youth in his town, his city, that have cerebral palsy or um, disabilities that make it hard for them to, to gain access to society. Um, so I've been, my, my family and I have been working with him for a few years. And I had the opportunity to, to meet with him and, and talk to the children and the, the families this last year. So this is kind of what prompted me to kind of deep dive into this. Um, these are the challenges they're facing, the transportation between home and their center. He runs a rehabilitation center in the middle of the city, but the youth are scattered all over in like low-income housing or rural um, and have a really hard time getting access to transport to get to the center or school or anywhere. Significant energy and time spent learning education basics, reading, writing, math. Um, this is a young student that I met um, who is already worried about um, uh, what he'll do when his, when his grandparents, who are the, his caretakers, pass away. How is he going to be able to support himself and his, you know, his, he wants to get married and have a family, so he's worried about that. So limited future employability and economic independence, the youth all express this desire to say, well, we want to you want to be independent, we want to be able to bring money uh, for our families. So how? Um, first thought is, you know, computers, technology. Um, with very with limited mobility, how and um, also verbal um, challenges, how to communicate? How can they realize their full potential? Um, so my focus has been on assistive communication devices. Um, and here I'm going to take a tangent, um, and hopefully I'm on time, but. So here, that was kind of the problem, the what and the why, um, and then I'm going to go into the how. Um, um, but at the back of my mind is, well, how can it be sustainable? How can it be not like a charity where we drop devices there and have people try to use them and see what happens? But how can it be locally driven where they understand the opportunities and are going to pick and select and maybe even develop what works for them because it's a unique situation for everyone. And maybe earn, um, be able to provide that service for others. So the online maker community, I mentioned this at the beginning, specific to kind of the challenge that I'm addressing, there's an iWriter example. Um, a, a group of makers, I guess you could call them, built this device for um, this gentleman who is a famous graffiti artist. He had ALS um, that limited his ability to move. The only thing he could move with his, was his eyes. And his um, street name is Tempt One. So they basically designed this device that re 
tracked his eyes and allowed him to draw on the computer. And they were able to do that for $50 to $100 in parts, which is a significant difference from what is on the market. Um, so then he did a drawing from his hospital bed and they were able to project it on a building so that he could still engage in his passion. Um, so like these guys say, we're not in the business of reinventing. Um, it's really an attempt to address a gap in the development of low-end eye tracking systems. Super cheap eye tracker that could be made by almost anyone, almost anywhere. So this is kind of the idea of throwing out there that this do-it-yourself community, this maker community could potentially make things where they are and make them uniquely for the, the individual that needs them. Um, it continues to develop. They went to a version two. Um, a group, group in South Korea took it up and tried to build an ecosystem around it that the government actually took and said, well, we can help distribute this, we can help subsidize it so more people have access. Um, unfortunately, I tried to get a hold of them. I haven't heard from them on did it really work? Did it really get picked up? I don't know. Um, but they developed that software for, further. So what I did is I said, well, if a business person that has no technical expertise, this is totally new, can do this, can take the instructions off online and build it and it functions, then maybe we have something here. So I attempted to do it. Um, the Mani Watu is kind of the name I put on the concept of of these initiatives. Um, so we, we built it from the online um, instructions and it works, um, but not as well as I would hope or I don't think it could be used by one of the youth in, in China as it is. Um, so online community, again, the focus of all this, this is all the people that put effort into making just that simple device. So a lot of people um, are out there that are willing to contribute their time. On that other channel, technology advances. Um, so it's point advanced manufacturing options. This is what I'm also doing, We're trying to understand how potentially this could be applied in country. What kind of resource mix would work um, that could be affordable and help make higher quality devices for people. Um, and I kind of talked about this already. Um, so I'm trying to tie this into uh, this initiative as well. Um, and that's it. So any questions? Did that make any sense or did the wine uh, totally mess up this presentation? people that are also working with people that have conditions like ALS and CP 
because there really are a lot of crossovers, and so I hope that people can kind of come together and look at ways that it's not about the person with disability, but about how we want it to work. Because I do think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, one thing I do want to um, really ask people to do also is check in with people that might use these apps. I know there's a lot of beta testing in very small groups, um, and the Center for Accessible Technology, we do have groups of people that meet on a regular basis, and we have a huge database based upon um, the age group or the disability that you're interested in looking at, and so um, it could potentially be people that um, maybe are visually impaired and need to use speech recognition um, or lots of other conditions, but they use speech recognition on a regular basis. And so I do think there are lots of groups in the community that um, would be very interested in testing, um, and I find that many companies do a very small group, but they don't have kind of a large sampling of people that actually need these products. Um, there are tons of parents like Nia that are super proactive and awesome and out there, um, but there are lots of other parents that kind of sit back and wait for people to step in. And so I do think it's really on us to, when we see people in the community that can use this technology, that we talk about it and really um, demonstrate it. And one thing I don't see is uh, I use assistive communication sometimes um, in a group that I ran, and I would actually take the assistive communication out and I would order drinks at a bar with my iPad, and people didn't treat me the same. They didn't look at my eyes, they didn't talk to me like a, a human, and so it was very interesting to me. And I do really stress for people to use products, not just once or twice to sample it, but try using speed rec recognition or these other things for a week, to try doing everything that you need to, because you will discover there are things that you cannot do with it, and you will start to figure out those bugs and glitches much faster if you actually try the product yourself for an extended period of time and not just for a couple of hours. So I do recommend that. Uh, that's all I have to say. I'm excited to chat with people. Um, Lois and I also, uh, we were at a hackathon last year and we actually won. So now we have this kind of like bug of like wanting to, to figure out how to build better apps. Uh, because we do work with people on a regular basis, we see the impact in their daily lives. Um, and I think that the one thing that we have offered sometimes is just a little bit of hope and raised expectations. Um, that's great, you can say the numbers. Let's move beyond that. Let's do whatever we can to, to increase your experience and your connection with the world, because that's really what we're about. Is it's not connecting with technology, it's really helping people connect with each other um, and use this technology as, as much as possible. Thank you very much. Um, how do people like Nia get funding to continue their work within this uh, arena? Well, well, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm submitting an anti-autism speaks, and I'm sure, you know, that there are, will be other sources. And, uh, well, I do think the X can chip in. Yeah, no, I mean, I do think that uh, these, these are opportunities where we have people that may have a business background and people that do have other resources available. Um, and I think that, you know, what Nia brings is this experience of the day-to-day -day life of living with someone who has a communication disorder and that, that really needs support and the technology to do that. And so I think that, you know, hopefully we come together, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I think that um, there's a lot of really talented people and a lot of products um, that are focused on things like education um, and are very niche markets. Um, assistive technology and assistive communication items are very expensive. And so I'm very I'm glad to see that there is some open source um, stuff going on. And with assistive technology, I find that um, there are lending programs and lots of places for people to try it out. But it has to be so individualized that it gets to be thousands of dollars for someone to use the device practically on a day-to-day -day basis. And those families that don't have it um, may not use it. Um, and I would push also for, uh, we live in a very multilingual city and society, and I don't see a lot of apps being done in Spanish or Cantonese, which are major languages here. Um, and I also, I'm kind of a language nerd. Um, I speak Spanish and Mandarin, and so I'm always looking for ways to like move that forward. And I've had a hard time finding apps that are comparable and really can use those language skills so that children with special needs can also be bilingual or multilingual. Thanks so much, Jenny. You're welcome. That was great. Okay, so I hope that if everybody enjoyed this meetup and got something out of it, that you'll tell your other, you know, geek friends, and we can keep it going. And hopefully, 
anybody else that I can get up and speak? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Ilya from, um, Robin Labs. I'm, I'm, I'm liking at Robin Labs, and he just sold um, voice recognition app to Freddie Android, should it? Right? No, it's just sold. I mean, no, just sure. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was glad you got Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm late, I just arrived right now. So, uh, just a few words. I'm, uh, my name is Ilya Eckstein, I'm founder CEO of uh, Robin Labs. We have, uh, basically we develop speak voice, conversation voice interfaces. Uh, the most well-known product is probably an app called Robin on Android. It's been uh, downloaded um, over a million uh, times. So it's not a niche product, it's a product for the drivers, at least so it was initially initially intended. But we saw that A, a lot of people use it, pick it up even outside of the car, and B, every once in a while we get, we get users who are disabled in one way or another. They could be visually impaired, they, they could be uh, just in hospital after some uh, medical procedure or some other disability. And so um, I'm here basically to talk to people who need a technology uh, um, that, that, is, that we are developing. Um, we may not be aware of some certain pockets of needs. And, and so if you need a you know, conversation technology, come talk to me. We'll try to help with the constraints of being a uh, mostly self-funded startup. Okay. But we, we have some expertise because we have a lot of people using our product. That's basically what I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So does anybody else um, have anything they'd like to share? No matter how big or small or... Thank you all. Oh! I just wanted to kind of answer um, your question. I work in... smaller grants that are kind of um, pro the program managers for different programs within those agencies sometimes have smaller amounts of money, like maybe 100000 to do a small, a small, uh, generally those are really good for uh, special needs. Um, so, you know, do give those uh, a chance. Or you could run a bank or something. Yeah. Or a good cause. <laughs> the big issue is how do you sell the apps There needs to be a new business model uh, for funding companies in assistive technology, and you know, hopefully in the next 10 years that will happen. 10 years too late, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to say anything? Okay, well, thank you so much for coming, and let's keep in touch. Do it again.